Haiti was discovered by Christopher Columbus in 1492, the same year he discovered America. Haiti became an independent republic just 28 years after the United States secured its freedom from England and was thus hemisphered to break from European rule. Beyond those two points, there is little basis for comparison between the two countries. Haiti has had 30 rulers, all dictators. Haiti occupies the western third of the island of Hispaniola. It has never been on friendly terms with its neighbor to the east, the Dominican Republic. On the west lies Cuba, less than 50 miles away by sea. Here again is a relationship best described as hostile. The population of Haiti is probably close to 5 million. An exact census has never been made due to a combination of factors, inaccessible mountainous terrain, a scattered, predominantly rural living pattern, and a disinterested attitude toward record keeping. The entire country is approximately the size of the state of Maryland. Haiti, though regarded as one of the Latin American nations, is no more like Latin America than apples are like string beans. It's true you find such typical things as natives carrying heavy loads upon their heads and open marketplaces in which homegrown or home-raised products are traded, but generally speaking, the flavor of Haiti more rightfully belongs to another recipe. Making only a slight concession to their one-time French overlords, Haitians today maintain a superficial French tradition. 90% of them are Negro, 8% mulatto, and a mere 2% are white. They speak a language called Creole, a mixture of several tongues, mostly French, but not readily understood by the average Frenchman. If there is one distinguishing feature about Haiti that overshadows everything else, it is poverty. Whatever wealth there is belongs to the mulatto white minority with very few exceptions. The black inhabitant owns next to nothing. In the city, he lives in ghetto-like areas tiny square shacks with tin roofs. In the country, he works a parcel of farmland with a hoe and machete and lives off the food he produces. Unemployment is better than 50%. The average income for one whole year is less than $100. Life expectancy is low. The white Haitians we spoke to told us you cannot judge the nation by U.S. standards. They said the people are content with what they have since they have never known anything else. From our own observations, we noted that Haitians do seem happy and are quick to smile, even at strangers. And curiously, despite the undeniable poverty, we saw no signs, obvious signs, of hunger, like distended bellies or protruding ribs that are so much a part of places like India and China. But something that is very evident in Haiti is what you might call the omnipotence of President Duvalier. Turn your head, you see his picture everywhere, even on car windows. He's known most widely as Papa Doc, either affectionately or fearfully, depending on your point of view. Duvalier considers himself the greatest thing that ever happened to Haiti. He and the country are one. His most popular slogan, you are me and I am you. Papa Doc rules the people in a no-nonsense way. Opposition many times means death. The black Haitians we spoke to said there are two things a person can do to stay out of trouble. Mind your own business and keep your mouth shut. Otherwise, they said, you might find yourself staring down the barrel of a gun held by a tauntaun macoot. That expression, straight out of Haitian folklore, means boogeyman. It's not an official title, just a grotesque nickname. Either by accident or design, we did not see many uniformed Tantan Makut during our week-long stay in Haiti, except for a few stationed around the presidential palace. This does not mean that they were not in our presence. The majority of them are plain clothesmen and are inconspicuous in crowds. There they are at the palace. To describe them briefly, they are Duvalier's army within an army. Tantan outnumbering Haiti's regular 5,000-man militia about three to one. They are, to be frank, Papa Doc's hatchet men. At another time, in another place, they were known as stormtroopers.
Tauntaun Makut's reign of terror began in earnest in the summer of 1963, when Duvalier took brutal steps to block a threatened invasion by Haitian exiles from the Dominican Republic. These 25 men, women, and children, all Haitians, fled by boat to the Bahamas and then to Florida when the Tauntaun established a military zone along the Dominican border by burning down all homes in a two-mile-wide area the length of the border. Immigration authorities held hearings in Miami to determine if the Haitians should be granted political asylum in the United States. When the hearings stretched into four months, the exiles went on a hunger strike, saying they'd rather die than be forced to return home. They were later deported back to the Bahamas. The U.S., under President Kennedy, had cut off financial aid to Haiti in 1962 and apparently did not want any part of Duvalier pro or con. In Port-au-Prince, we spoke to Captain Jose Borg, a career Haitian military man, a member of the Palace Guard, and director of the government radio station. We asked him about the Tonton Makut. There is no Toto Makut group in Haiti. We have what we call the Voluntary of National Security. They are partisan of the president, and as we have not enough money to have a big army, we also train them. They are trained by the army, so in case of invasion and things like that, they can help the army to repel it, because we have a small little army, so if we get an invasion, we can move all the army to fight that, that invasion. So we get the militiamen, that's quite something like you get in the States, and you call it, I believe, the National Guard.